The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact to their business, and proactively address threats head on. Everybody out there, today is May 15th, 2015. I am Jeff Peters, Hacksurf for Editor. I'm here with Matt Leifus, Hacksurf for Writer, and Eric Severson, Surfwatch Lab Data Analyst. Coming up after the discussion, we have an interview with Brian Foster. He's the CTO of Dombala. Um, a few podcasts ago, uh, I think it was right before RSA, uh, we talked about their study where they said you're more likely to get struck by lightning than have mobile malware communicating out of your device. So we thought it'd be interesting to bring him on and actually talk about the mobile malware threat and uh, some of the research that their company did. But yeah, jump right into it. Throw it over to you, Matt, for the top cyber headlines from Surfwatch Labs data. Sure. Um, The top trending new target for the week was Firekeepers Casino Hotel. The company released a statement late last week saying that they were investigating a breach of their point of sale software. At this time, there's no further information about the breach or the findings in the investigation. However, the company did say that they have installed new point-of-sale equipment to help ensure customers that their information will be protected. It's important to note, I think, last week we had another hotel casino, and then recently we've seen White Lodging and a couple other hotels. It seems as the summer travel season gets going, uh, this might be a common target to see people attacking point of sale systems so anyone on travel for work or for yourself watch the uh, credit cards after yeah i'm sure if we see any more of that it'll definitely pop up in some of the uh new trending targets for the week we'll probably talk about it in a future podcast no doubt coming at number two we have the mat hassan memorial and i might have mispronounced that guys sorry about that the website for the memorial was hacked this week Unidentified hackers decided it would be a real fun idea to put uh, several child pornography images on the web page. Just to give a little background information, this memorial was a concentration camp in Austria where Nazi soldiers killed more than 100,000 people. The camp was liberated by U.S. troops in May of 1945, so if you do the math, the, this month marks the 70th anniversary. And this past Sunday, commemorations were held for that 70th anniversary of the liberation. And the third trending target this week was the Swedish resistance movement. And this is a little, uh, if you're going to back uh, hacking websites and hacktivism, I guess is a little better purpose. Uh, members of Anonymous Sweden took down two Nazi-supporting websites with a DDoS attack. Uh, the websites were hosted in Sweden. Anonymous Sweden announced the attack via Pastebin where they pointed out that it had been 70 years since Nazi Germany fell, but that the Nazi movement was still alive and well in Europe. The group also said that they will wipe out all the Nazis from the web. Uh, Those are the three top new trending targets for the week. Yeah, it seems like all these hacker groups are always trying to overstate everything. You know, they're trying to wipe Israel off the map, wipe Nazis off the web. I mean, I think that's pretty much impossible to do, but (laughs) good luck to them. And especially with like a single DDoS attack that takes their website offline for at a day tops, you know. Yeah, moving beyond uh, some of the attacks this week, I think one of the big headlines was this Venom vulnerability. CloudStrike on Wednesday, uh, they released some research. They found a critical vulnerability uh, in the code used by many computer virtualization platforms. And everyone's really been talking about this, sort of been the big story of the past couple days. The bug um, is known to affect the Zen, KVM, and native QMU virtualization platforms and appliances. And what it does is it makes it possible for the attackers to break out of the protected guest environments and take full control of the operating system. CrowdStrike's Jason Geffner, he's the one who, uh, the researcher who found the bug, uh, he said that millions of virtual machines are using one of these vulnerable platforms. And there's been a little bit of a back and forth. I think there's been a lot of criticism just in the way that the Venom bug was announced, uh, kind of much like Heartbleed and some of these other uh, SSL vulnerabilities from the past year. Um, They were really announced with, you know, a website and a logo and all this fanfare. So I think a lot of people are criticizing this, uh, this this Venom bug for that way. 
but it is, you know, um, still relatively serious. Rob Graham, he's the CEO of security firm Arata. He described this bug. He said it's a perfect bug for the NSA. Um, things like Bitcoin wallets, RSA private keys, forum passwords, and the like are easily found uh, by searching raw memory. So with this vulnerability, you know, it would be possible that, say, that the NSA could spend $100,000, buy a ton of $10 um, VPS instances and run the search and get all, you know, all sorts of passwords and things like that. So it sounds like a, a fairly serious vulnerability, although I don't know if it quite lives up to the heart bleed comparison. Yeah, to, I guess, kind of take it down a notch, you know, it doesn't affect some of the most popular virtualization programs, VMware, Microsoft, Hyper-V. These are some of the most popular out there, and they're totally fine. But as for the other ones, it's really just if you have a cloud provider, you call them and make sure they've applied this patch to their uh, virtualization servers, and they probably have. They had a few weeks to, to take care of it, and... And it's done. Like, it's it's not getting... I don't think it's worth getting too worked up about. It's worth fixing, worth talking about, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, so Venom's kind of been the big story the last couple days. I guess one story that I found maybe not funny, but kind of amusing, is Jamie Oliver popped back up in our data. I saw that you wrote an article on Hexer for about that, Matt. I believe it was third time just this year that uh, his website's shown up. Yep, it's the third time in 2015. It looks like, you know, same attack. There's actually evidence that all three attacks really stem from the very first one. As a matter of fact, uh, Jerome Segura of Malwarebytes, after the second attack, said that he had his doubts that about the website being free and clear of uh, the malware from the first attack. And he also went on to say that it's quite common for hack servers to retain parts of the infection and that it can still be used by hackers in the future. So there's evidence suggesting that all three of these attacks are really, you know, stem from the very first time and that the malware and all the, the infection just was not completely erased. They're not the only ones. Uh, we've seen this sort of happen a couple times lately. The company or a site that was breached is uh, seeing a repeat hack. The big one this week, I guess, is Sally Beauty Holdings. About this time last year, they had a point-of-sale credit card breach, and now they've got another one. You know, it's 25,000 cards last time, and they haven't given a number for this time, but they just confirmed that it is the case. Just last month, we saw White Lodging that runs some hotels. Uh, they showed up in 2014, so you might think oh, they got attacked, they fixed everything, now it's fine. But these kinds of attacks could make them a target for other groups, or it might be that they haven't wiped out all of the vulnerabilities. And uh, so one attack might lead to another. Um, if anyone's been breached, be on the lookout for other attacks trying to exploit those same problems. Yeah, there was a, another interesting story this week. I don't know if you guys have been following this whole Traversa Lab MD story, but earlier this week, Richard Wallace, he's a former investigator with cybersecurity company Traversa. He testified in federal court that the company was routinely engaging in fraud. Um, CNN Money used the term mafia style shakedowns, um, but basically they tried to scare potential clients. Traversa would typically make up a fake data breach and then pressure the firms to pay up. And so what they did, um, according to Richard Wallace, at least, is in order to make the breaches look legit, Traversa's investigators would download sensitive files, uh, move them to the company's servers, and alter information to make it appear as though the files had been accessed or stored by a variety of IP addresses. So they would make it look like you know known or suspected identity thieves had, had downloaded some files or, or stolen some files. So this story's really been going on for a long time. This uh, connection to LabMD actually goes all the way back to 2008. Traversa allegedly contacted LabMD back in 2008, claiming that it had a 1,178-page file with sensitive information from a peer-to-peer -peer network and that it saw others downloading um, the file, which I believe contained like patient information or something from LabMD. LabMD turned down Traversa's offer to help, um, and after that, Traversa gave the file to the FTC, and the allegation is that the data in there was bogus, but what happened was LabMD got in trouble, they got caught in this uh, prolonged legal, legal battle that's been going on for years, 
And in 2014, LabMD was effectively forced out of business. Uh, now it operates as an insolvent entity that simply provides records to former patients, LabMD said. Um, so it's kind of a crazy ongoing story that's been going on for years. And we hear so much about this, this FUD in the cybersecurity industry. You know, as we were just talking about with Venom, people sort of overstating um, sometimes what things are. And now uh, here we have a, an actual case, an actual lawsuit going on. Um, where people, you know, we might have proof that maybe one company, Traversa, um, at least might have engaged in this type of activity. I wonder where it's more difficult, like faking a data breach or actually breaching someone's network. I, I, I would I would be interested to see what's involved in uh, doing that. Yeah, and it's a pretty big company. These are some pretty serious uh, claims. And they, of course, Tiversa, of course, uh, refutes it, says it's not true. There's a bitter employee making up things because he's been fired. But it involves LabMD and the FTC case, which has been a really interesting court battle over the whole world of regulating cybercrime and, and breaches. So this is dramatic twist, I guess. This is cybersecurity soap opera right now. Yeah, so moving on to our cyber tip of the week. This week in Capsula, I posted a blog post um, about a botnet comprised of thousands or tens of thousands of uh, of small office, home office um, routers. So I, I wrote an article about that earlier this week, and just doing a little research, I found this uh, this paper from Tripwire from, I think it was back in February. But they were just saying that there's a, a really high risk um, of these Soho routers, so if you ever, uh, if you, or if you're a business and you have remote workers or employees that you know connect from home or anything like that, what Tripwire found was I think it was 74% of Amazon's top 50 um, home office routers uh, had vulnerabilities. And the important thing to note is that within the group of people that that use these kind of routers, um, they said fewer than half said that their router firmware was up to date, and less than a third knew how to update their firmware. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if you're a business out there to make sure that you're, if you have employees uh, using these kind of routers or working from home or connecting from outside the office, uh, just to make sure that they know how to get their firmware and get those routers patched so they're not vulnerable and just make sure that you're training them up on that. That's it for this week's discussion. Coming up, we have our interview with Brian Foster, the CTO of Dambala on mobile malware. <laughs> Big headlines making the rounds after you guys released your study was that you're 1.3 times more likely to get struck by lightning than have mobile malware communicated on your device. So I think that's a good place to start. It's a pretty catchy headline. Any thoughts on that? So one of the interesting parts of Dumbala, the company I work for, is you know is we sit in ISPs and telcos and we help them find infected subscribers using some of the technology that we've developed. And, and kind of an artifact of that is we also have this visibility into their networks and gives us the ability to see, you know, how many infected subscribers are there. You know, no surprise in some of the large landline subscribers, you know, or uh, landline ISPs, you know, we find hundreds of thousands of infected, you know, subscribers on a daily basis. Well, you know, we also sit in, you know, 50% of mobile data traffic in North America we're looking at. And, and it's, it's in that data that this report that one of my researchers had kind of come out with that, you know, based on the data that we're looking at, for this mobile data traffic over a couple of weeks that, you know, in, in the fall of last year, you know, we found just a very small number of mobile devices that were communicating out to true mobile malicious command and control or malicious sites. And, and when you look at it in totality of the total amount of traffic, it's just like you stated, you know, uh, you, according to the, uh, the group that had come up with the estimate on, you know, your chance of getting struck by lightning, that your you know that those odds or that probability was higher than you actually having mobile malware on your on your device. Yeah, no. When you guys uh, found that number, did that surprise you? Because a lot of times you look at just the headlines on these various technology sites. Uh, like I think just a couple of days ago, I saw one that said one in five Android apps is actually a malicious app. So when you look at all these headlines, I mean, it kind of paints the opposite picture. So were you surprised by the results? Yeah, I wasn't surprised. Um, Partially because uh, this was actually 
uh, we were redoing some research that we actually did originally in 2012. And so when the research came out in 2012, you know, that was when, you know, I was a little bit more, I was a little bit more startled that the numbers were so low. And then when we did the research again last year, it, it showed that, that nothing's really changed in terms of overall percentages. Cause back in 2012, when we first did this, it was low as well. Um, but, but it does, you know, it does bring up some interesting conversations, you know, because you do see a lot of security companies come out talking about how much mobile malware is out there and what a problem it is. And it's, it's one of those things where, if, you know, and, and just my background, Jeff, remember, you know, I worked at Symantec, I worked at Mac, you know, so I've been involved and, and ran the teams that, that, you know, looked at, you know, trying to monetize security on mobile devices. And, and obviously, you know, there's an incentive there that if we can get people to behave similarly on their mobile devices than on their PCs where they go get a, a subscription for security on their, on their phone, that, that that's obviously a, a good business for the kind of existing security establishment, if you will. So I, I think there's some motives behind the the FUD behind mobile malware to make it that make it a bigger deal than it is to to for for these large companies to to make money the way they used to. And so this report and this data comes out kind of in stark contrast to that and contradicts it. And there's a couple couple of caveats or there's a couple of ways um, to to discuss it. One of them is you know our data is based in the U.S. only, and the, the major Supposition we make as far as why mobile malware isn't isn't as distributed around on people's phones is because of the highly curated app stores through which you get all the applications that run on your Android or iOS device. You know, unless you jailbreak your phone, you can't get an app to run on your device unless it comes to those app stores. And Apple and, and, and there's and I think there's two main benefits to those app stores. The the first is you know Apple and Google they do have security technologies that they run on apps automatically before they get added to the app stores. That's one of the benefits. And the other benefit is, as soon as an app is noticed as it's malicious, Apple and Google can flip a bit on their side and prevent it from running on anybody's device around the world. And so those app stores basically make it so that the threat actors who are trying to, most cases or a lot of cases, trying to build a monetary or a business around getting malware distributed on endpoints and having that malware do things for them, on mobile phones, they can't distribute it enough so that the economics of that makes sense. I mean, they can't get enough devices owned out there for their malware for them to to profit. And and the app stores are, I think, the main reason why. And, and so I say all of that because, you know, when I look at the data, you know, it's U.S. only. In U.S., we also have very highly curated and forced app stores. You can go to parts of the world, though, like China, where Google and Apple don't have as enforced app, app stores, or at least the Android market uh, isn't as uh, enforced by Google, right? So you can see why and how there could be more examples of malware uh, in China just because they're not highly, as highly, the apps aren't as highly curated and controlled by like by Google. Anyways, I said a lot there. Let me let me pause and and see what you think. I was reading, you know, the, the press release you guys put out, and I believe in there you said that the true extent of mobile risks is still not widely understood. So maybe now you guys are doing yeah. some research and you have a little more insight. Um, I don't know if you have any specifics on on what mobile risks are actually out there. Is it that the whole thing is kind of maybe overblown in some ways, or is there um, some specific things that we still should be really concerned about? You know, I, I think there there are areas of concern, um, and I think one of the main points that I tell people as I explain this data is one thing the data shows is that you know the issues of the past are not necessarily the issues of the future as we move to, to spending more of our, our computing time on a mobile device instead of in front of a computer or a, a PC. And by that, I mean, you know, on Windows particularly, you know, any old app could be downloaded from the internet and ran, and, and you, you could, you know, get an email, click a link, and that link could automatically take advantage of a vulnerability to get an app to download behind the scenes. That was kind of the operational model for a lot of malware on the PC that, that, that sparked and fed and fueled this criminal enterprise, if you will, you know, th that operation, the operational side of that doesn't work the same way on a mobile device because of these app stores, right? So, so the problems of the past are not necessarily the problems of the future. However, that doesn't mean there's not different problems in the future that we need to think about and, and solve in different ways. And, and I think mobile devices do bring along different challenges, different risks, you know, and a great example of this is, you know, you're, you're more likely to lose your phone than you are your PC, you know, leave it behind in a cab or whatever. And so, and you're doing more and more of your work, um, reading emails, reading documents, and, and 
you know, maybe critical IP of your company on your mobile phone, right? So if you have a high risk of losing the device and it's got IP on it, well, then you got to also think about well, how do I secure the data on this device so that in case I lose it, you know, unintentionally, uh, it can't show up somewhere and, and get someone to take advantage of it. So I, I still think that, you know, there is a, a data protection element to your mobile device that, that I think is increased with mobile devices. I think that there's still, you know, a lot of access through your phone to your personal life and to your data that's in the cloud. And, and so, you know, if you think about back over the last uh, year, I think that, I forget how long ago it was, but some, some people had guessed the passwords for some celebrities for their um, iCloud accounts. And because they were able to guess those passwords, they were able to go up and find pictures that they had taken that had uploaded to iCloud. And of course, it included some risky shot, risque shots and, and other things with some, some of those celebrities that, that made its way out into to the press. Well, that wasn't because of a vulnerability in the phone. It was because of weak passwords. But the important point is, and this is once again where you think about what are the security risks that are kind of new that you've got to think about with your phone is your phone's becoming your passport to your digital cloud, to your, to your online existence, right? How do you also protect that it is you who, you know, you say you are when you're accessing your cloud? And so it's not so much as there's a security problem on the phone that you want to solve on the phone, but there are security challenges to your digital life that you can solve on your phone. So, for example, you know, what if the only way you can access your iCloud is through some type of, of uh, uh, human factor authentication, like your voice, your face, things like that? You know, so there's also things that the phone or the mobile device enables you to do from a security perspective, even if it's not solving it. So all of that goes to say, as I, I sum it up kind of like I said earlier, the security problems and challenges and risks are different on a phone, and you have to think about those risks and think about how they solve them and uh, and so forth. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know, sort of given that scenario you kind of painted, just wondering if you have any thoughts on if, you know, businesses are kind of on the right track or the wrong track, because we hear a lot about, you know, especially the last couple of years about bring your own devices and device security and that kind of stuff. Just kind of any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I do think so. I mean, I uh, I run into more and more businesses that that have already a mobile device management solution, which I think were kind of the one of the first generations, if you will, of how do I how do I control these devices that access my enterprise information. You're seeing kind of the next generation of technologies to solve that problem be a little bit more around wrapping your specific enterprise applications with security, so that you you don't have to. Because a lot of these MDMs, some of these MDMs are like sandboxes in a way that you ran applications on the phone, and, and you lost some of the user experience of your phone when you did so. The um, so, for example, you know you had to replace your, your Google Calendar, your Apple Calendar, with one that came in this app, for example, it wouldn't be, you know, as as useful, what have you. You know, you're seeing that technology continue to change to to wrap the on the phone applications so that you know any data that comes from the enterprise can only be seen by something that could get authenticated through the enterprise and, and ensure data integrity if you will you're seeing that change and you're seeing enterprises you know adopt those you know and i think it obviously starts kind of with the forward leaning enterprises but but even what i would call some of the laggard enterprises are are starting to adopt the mdm functionality and, and next waves of technology that come around that the final question i have is um I started covering cybersecurity a couple of years ago, and everyone I interviewed, or a lot of people, uh, would kind of talk about how this mobile malware boom was coming and how it was going to be so terrible. But now it's two years later, and I guess it hasn't really happened. So I was just wondering maybe, um, at least in the U.S., it hasn't happened. So um, just kind of looking forward, I mean, do you think that that's something that's going to continue where we're not going to see, um, I guess, that, that stuff that everyone was predicting a couple of years ago? Yeah, yeah. Just just to, for context, I mean, I started working on, you know, mobile malware solutions back in like 2002, and so I go way back into seeing people talk about the next year is going to be the year of mobile malware. You know, and as soon as that happens, boom. And uh, so I've, I've certainly recognized and seen that phenomenon myself. I, I will tell you that as long as these app stores are highly curated and and your phones are locked and, and you only get apps to these app stores. I really don't think that um, financial based malware is, is ever going to be really successful just because you, you're just never going to solve that distribution problem. Now that said, right there, there, 
it is possible still to build an app and have it get a couple people to download and run it, you know, before uh, Apple, Google catch up to it, you know. And so if, if the motive of the attackers is, is other than financial, so maybe it's a nation state, uh, maybe it's some other type of targeted attack, I, I think those are attacks that are more than likely to be, you can make those successful. If, but, you know, once again, the motive there is not financial. And, and the, from a broad perspective, you know, unless you're somebody that would be targeted, you know, because you're a celebrity or a high government official, you know, you're, 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 you're safe. Nobody's going to target you and go through the effort just to get you to download this one app and, and so forth. So I would want to go down and say I think it's a year or two away. You know, I think as long as the, the dynamics are in the market today, I think are going to prevent that. And it's just because the different types of risks and issues that we're going to need to solve. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time, Brian. Appreciate it. No problem. I enjoyed it as always. Thanks for listening to this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can follow us on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you listen. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.